Today's gospel is taken from the 20th chapter of John, beginning at the 19th verse. It was still the first day of the week. That evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he replied, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my fingers in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, My Lord and my God. Jesus replied, do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll. But these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing, you will have life in his name. Here ends the reading. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God. Please be seated. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day, for this uh, marvelous Sunday. We thank you for new life among us, for baptism and incorporation into the family of God. And we thank you, God, that You've brought us together in this place so that we might hear your word. Open our ears, our eyes, our hearts to receive it. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. When I was growing up in uh, the Pittsburgh area in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, there was one constant all the way through that time, and that is that every night at 6 o'clock, uh, my mom would watch Eyewitness News on Channel 2, KDKA with Bill Burns, and who was eventually joined by his daughter, Patty. They were the first father-daughter, and probably the only father-daughter anchor team ever. And, um, and they, they brought the news every night, and, and uh, Bill Burns would say after every newscast, he would say, good night, good luck, and good news tomorrow. And that was it, because that's where we got the news, right? We got the news from local news. Nowadays, everybody gets their news from all kinds of different sources. We don't watch local news as much, except maybe for the weather. We can pop online anytime and grab it. But it was an event back then, and it was a real event if you got interviewed on the news for some reason. If you were at some, uh, some event and you happened to get interviewed, everybody would, would run home to watch themselves on television. Now you can just wait till it comes out on the website and go look it up, but, but back then it was appointment television. And even now, when I go back home to western Pennsylvania, I love to, to watch Eyewitness News or Channel 4 Action News because of the interviews. And they interview people who are eyewitnesses to events, whether it's a, a water main break in Blahnox, which is an actual place, or, or, or a robbery in Squirrel Hill, or a a fire, that's how you say it, fire, down in the Strip District, they're going to cover it, and they're going to interview someone with a Western Pennsylvania accent, and it is fantastic. It's fantastic. Yuns wouldn't have believed it. And cops were running down the street like 100 mile an hour. 
And they caught them guys down by the strip. It was unbelievable in that. You would not have believed it. Now, I know it's not funny to you, clearly, but it warms my heart to know that there are still people out there seeing these things. They're eyewitnesses. And they're not always accurate, right? Because we learn later that what they saw probably wasn't exactly what they saw. In fact, I saw a statistic this week that suggests that that eyewitness testimony is not always reliable. The Innocence Project, which has done a lot of work um, with DNA testing to exonerate people who have been put in prison. And there was a fascinating statistic here that said that of the overturned cases that they've done with DNA, 73% of them were made originally based on eyewitness testimony. 73%. And of those, a third had two or more mistaken eyewitnesses. That, that's a pretty high rate. It's easy to see why eyewitnesses can get things wrong. I mean, uh, over time, memories decay. Anyone? Uh, over time, our eyesight gets worse. Anyone? Um, you know, uh, over time, you know, we might talk to those around us. You know, there's something called eyewitness talk. It's a phenomenon that, that several witnesses may talk about an event, and as they talk to one another, they kind of clarify each other's story until they, they kind of come up with the same thing. They don't do it intentionally. It just kind of happens. It's like a, a group think. And so it pays to be skeptical when listening to eyewitness reports, and you need to go then and, and trust and verify. And in our 24-hour news cycle, when people are being interviewed or they pop stuff up right away, we tend to see a lot of fake news because people aren't always accurate in their observations. In today's gospel, we get a similar kind of story, but it's a, it's a familiar one that, that reminds us that eyewitness testimony, while reliable, always needs verification. We call this person Doubting Thomas in the text. That's the nickname that we give him. But I think it's an unfair nickname. Because remember that, that Thomas hasn't really been doubting all along. He's been one of the twelve. Back in chapter 11, we saw him when Jesus was going back to Judea for the funeral of Lazarus. They knew it was going to be dangerous for him to go back there. And so uh, La uh, uh, Thomas says basically, well, he's going there to die. We might as well go and die with him. That's not the, the sound of someone who's really doubting what's going on. He's been a, a firm follower of Jesus. But he hears about this appearance that Jesus has made after his resurrection to the rest of the disciples, and Thomas is not there. And so he, he might think, justifiably so, that they, they might have had a collective eyewitness talk, that, that maybe they saw something, or maybe they thought they saw something, but, but how do you know? Maybe it's group groupthink. Maybe it's a, a mass hallucination of some nature. The text is kind of breathless in its description. The doors are locked. The disciples are hiding out there in fear of the Jewish leaders. Now Mary Magdalene, if you remember Easter, she had come to them and said, I have seen the Lord. Now Luke tells us in his version that they dismissed the, the testimony of the women, which was pretty typical in the ancient world because women were not supposed to testify in court because they were known to be, quote, unreliable witnesses, end quote. I'm, not, I'm just telling you the way it was, ladies. I'm not saying that's the way it is. I'm just telling you the way it was. They were considered to be unreliable witnesses. And so in Luke's gospel, it says they dismissed it as an idle tale. Like, really? Come on. And so they're locked behind the doors. They don't know what to do. And then suddenly Jesus appears and says, peace be with you. He shows them the wounds in his hands and in his side and in his feet. We have this strange combination of things going on. You've got uh, Jesus risen in a physical body. The, the tomb is empty, and yet he can walk through locked doors. It's a different kind of body, but a body nonetheless. Paul talks about this more in 1 Corinthians 15. If you use the devotional guide this week, you read through that. At any rate, the disciples see Jesus, and they're filled with joy. Mary's testimony is vindicated, and then Jesus commissions them in what becomes John's version of Pentecost. It says that Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this was the fulfillment of the promise he had made 
during the farewell discourse. I will send the advocate, the one who will come and teach you all things. But there's another connection here, yet another connection back to the creation story. If you remember back to Genesis chapter 2, when God creates Adam out of the dust of the ground, it says that he breathed into him, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Jesus breathes on these disciples. And as we said last week during Easter, Jesus is the new Adam. And now, by breathing on his disciples, they are the new humanity. The new people made possible because of Jesus' death and resurrection. These spiritual offspring will now have a mission. As the Father has sent Jesus to carry out his redemptive mission for the world through his death and resurrection, so now Jesus is sending his disciples into the world to announce the good news of all that he had done, to proclaim the death of death, to proclaim Christ as Lord, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And they will have authority to forgive sins. In other words, the ability to mediate God's forgiveness through the news that they bring about Jesus to the world. Now, it's interesting when you read this in the Greek, and, and Jason, every time I preach, Jason's sitting in the front row, and uh, he has out his Greek Bible, right? It's, it's the original Greek, and he's reading it while I'm talking. So I'm always like, what's he thinking? You know, like, because he's a Greek scholar. I took enough Greek in seminary to be dangerous. He actually liked it, okay? I took, I took Greek 101. It wasn't even for credit. You had to use it to qualify to take a class. So you got no credit for this class. We called it bonehead Greek. And it was full of boneheads trying to learn Greek. We used to say a chant every class. Greek's an ancient language, at least it used to be. It killed off all the ancient Greeks, and now it's killing me. That's what we used to say. But what little I do know is that the verb tense matters. And in this case, in that particular verse, the verse, the verb is in the perfect tense, which means that the disciples are claiming something that God has already done. Remember back to chapter 1, when John the Baptist said of Jesus, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now that has happened in Jesus, but that forgiveness has to be received in order to be activated. So he gives them authority to forgive sins, but if people do not receive that forgiveness, then they are not authorized to just give it regardless. It has to be received. John makes this more clear in 1 John, which the same writer probably wrote that and the gospel. Listen to 1 John 1, 9, and 10. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from everything we've done wrong. If, on the other hand, we claim we have never sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And so again, as we've seen over and over again through our journey through John's gospel, John's point is, what will you do with Jesus? Will you receive him? Or will you reject him? There are consequences either way. Now, all of this is in the background, and all of this happens while Thomas is not present with the other disciples. So when they tell him, we have seen the Lord, notice they use the exact same words as Mary. We've seen the Lord. Thomas is rightly skeptical of their eyewitness talk. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands to put my hand in his side, I won't believe. Thomas would make a great CSI. He's looking for forensic evidence. Habeas corpus, produce the body. Show me the evidence. And we're post-enlightenment people. I was trained as a historian. You always follow the evidence. Show me where it is. I need to see lots of it. And you realize that eyewitness testimony alone is, is kind of difficult because you could be standing there and see two different things. So, so how, do we, how do we know? Thomas, Thomas, I think, is very much like many of us. In fact, in the Gospels, he's often called Thomas the twin. Who's the other twin? Maybe it's us. Maybe it's intended to point to us as people who are like Thomas. It's important to note, though, that Thomas is still with the disciples at this point. It says that, Eight days later, eight days later, Thomas is still with these 
people. Now, you would think if Thomas was really out of sorts, he would have listened to them talk about this nonstop for eight days. And finally, at some point, about, oh, six hours into, I don't know, day one, I might have said, enough, and gone off by myself. But no, Thomas stays with them. See, the reality here is that Thomas is not opposed to the idea of resurrection. After all, he's a Jew. They believe in the resurrection of the body at the end, when God returns. He doesn't reject the idea outright. He simply wants more evidence. He wants the same evidence that the other disciples had received. No more, no less. They had, hadn't believed either until Jesus showed up. Now, suddenly, Jesus shows up again. And the pattern repeats. A locked door, an appearance. Jesus says, peace be with you. It's the exact same conditions. And Jesus goes straight to Thomas and seems to know what he's thinking. He offers the evidence. Put your finger here. Put your hand in my side. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. No more disbelief. Believe. Now, we're post-enlightenment people. We're, we're kind of like in this place where we want to see the evidence first. So seeing is believing. But we've already learned that, that sometimes we don't see correctly. What Jesus seems to be saying, on the other hand, is quite the opposite. He seems to be saying to Thomas, believing is seeing. Notice what happens here. Thomas, the text doesn't tell us that Thomas puts his hands in the wounds of Jesus. Jesus' presence is enough. And so Thomas makes a confession of faith. My Lord and my God. The presence of Jesus is enough evidence for Thomas. And what John seems to be implying is that the presence of Jesus should be enough evidence for us too. Notice what he says to Thomas. Do you believe because you have seen me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. Thomas is kind of representative of us, and, and Jesus is speaking through John to those future generations, to us, about the nature of faith. He's giving evidence. He's asking us to believe it, but not just on the basis of eyewitness testimony. He wants us to believe because the Holy Spirit given to us continues to act as a witness to the resurrection and a witness to Jesus' ongoing presence with us. So Christ is present with us through the Holy Spirit that he has given to us, that he has breathed onto us. It's evidence that's important for us as we await his return in body. Now, hear me. It's not that evidence is unimportant or that this is just a leap of faith. The evidence for the resurrection is actually quite compelling from a historical standpoint. I mean, if you were going to make up a story that would draw a lot of people in, that would be believable, you would not make it up this way. You would not have, for example, a woman as your primary witness. That, that wouldn't work in the ancient world. You wouldn't claim that a body that had been dead had risen and was now alive. What you would probably talk about, on the other hand, which is what many people talk about today, even in reference to Jesus, you'd probably talk something more about the, uh, the immortality of the soul. See, that was a lot more palatable because most Greco-Romans believed in the mortality of the soul, immortality of the soul. They were, they were uh, uh, Platonists. They believed in the separation of body and spirit. So if the, the disciples had gone around and said that, that Jesus had ridden, risen in spirit and appeared to them and then had drifted off to heaven, everybody would have said, well, that's great for you. That's really awesome. But that's not what they said. They used the word resurrection. A body that was dead was now alive. It was the equivalent of saying that you'd been abducted by a UFO. I mean, people in the ancient world knew that dead bodies tended to stay dead. This was an anomaly. It would have been difficult for pagans to believe in anything other than immortality of the soul. 
On the other hand, in speaking with the Jews, they would have said that anyone hung on a tree was cursed. So therefore, this couldn't possibly be the Messiah. And we know that the resurrection of the dead comes at the end of time, not in the middle of time. So what are you all talking about? You see, this was a virtually impossible message to get people to believe in the ancient world. And yet somehow, somehow, the message went out. And despite all of the efforts to, to suppress this, by the Romans and by the Jewish authorities, the word began to spread. Something happened here, something significant. Despite all the efforts to discredit and destroy the people who talked about it, they wouldn't shut up. Charles Colson, who was special counsel to President Nixon in the early 70s, was known as Nixon's hatchet man. Uh, he got caught up in the Watergate scandal and spent seven months in prison. And he became a Christian while he was in prison. And it was his own criminal conviction that convinced him of the reality of resurrection. He said this. He said, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that, that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Every one was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. We have eyewitness testimony from the Gospels. We have evidence of the early church's growth despite the forces arrayed against it. We have the witness of subsequent generations of Christian witnesses, especially those who are martyred for their faith and continued to be so even today. Look at the news. In fact, the word witness in Greek is martyreo. Martyrs. All of these attest to Jesus' resurrection from the dead. But all of that evidence and proof, while vital and essential, is not the real currency of Christian life. What is required for the Christian is faith. Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not see, seen. Uh, C.S. Lewis said he believed in Christianity just as he believed in the Son, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. John wrote his gospel not only to give us evidence for Christ, but primarily to enable faith. Look again at verse 31. These things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing you will have life in his name. Ultimately, it's a matter of faith. And so we gather not just to examine the evidence, although I'll give you plenty of that, but to celebrate faith that helps us interpret the world. When we believe, we begin to see all that God has done, all that God has made possible through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And when we live out that belief, it's then that we become eyewitnesses ourselves, eyewitnesses to what Christ has done in us. Remember, this is Jesus' charge to his disciples that they go to be witnesses. He's given them the Holy Spirit so that they might go and boldly witness with the assurance of truth. But in order to be an eyewitness, you first have to see something, right? You have to have your own encounter with Christ. Your own story to tell. Yins wouldn't have believed it. I once was lost. Now I'm found. I was blind. But now I see in that. You're still not getting this. <laughs> right? You need to have your own story. We cannot put our hands on him today. But we can't put our faith in him. We can tell the story of what he has done for us. Your story is unique. We can same risen Lord, but we all do it in different ways. We see him from different standpoints, different ways that Christ comes to us. Maybe it's like Paul, you get knocked off your horse and gee, the risen Christ stands on your chest, puts his finger in your face and says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Okay, that'll get your attention. Or maybe it's more subtle. 
Maybe it's an encounter with the risen Christ over time. Maybe it's a long, dark night of the soul that brings you to that place. I don't know. My first encounter with Jesus was as a young child, not much older than Lucy. This is Dunn's Vacation Bible School class, second grade. The day we burned matches and stuck them to the crosses. They let us burn matches in second grade, believe it or not. Back in the day, it was a great day. Do you want to ask Jesus into your heart? Sure I do. I didn't know what that meant. But I knew it was a good thing. I didn't know how good. I'm still learning. The story's still evolving. You'll be my witnesses, says Jesus. You have a story to tell. How will you tell that story to others? Will you tell it even when they look at you skeptically? Will you tell it no matter what someone might think of you? or what they might do to you. See, the world needs more bold Christian witnesses, more people to spread the good news in ways that are personal and persuasive. And we need to do that because it's good news. Good news for today. Good news tomorrow. To whom will all the ends give your eyewitness news. Go and tell the story. My Lord and my God. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for this great story of Thomas. We relate to him. We relate to wanting to know more, to wanting to experience you. Help us, Lord, to have faith to follow you. In the name of Christ, we pray.